Our first speaker is Noah Rubin. Uh, Noah has recently made the transition from the East Coast uh, to the West Coast, so he is now at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he has made significant contributions to metasurface polarization optics, working on both the theory and the application of polarization-sensitive optical elements. And he aims uh, through this workshop to advance the performance of coronagraphs with metasurfaces and pushing the boundaries of what we can achieve in high contrast imaging. So Noah, thank you for, for coming. Look forward to listening to your talk. Switch this on. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Ken. Um, my name is Noah Rubin. I'm a, I'm a new assistant professor at the University of California, San Diego. Um, I recently uh, joined there from where I did my PhD in postdoctoral research at Harvard University, as Kent mentioned, on the East Coast. And I'm very flattered that. Uh, the organizers chose me today to introduce this field, uh, which is called metasurfaces. I'm not a fan of the term metasurfaces, which is why it's in quotes. Um, maybe I'll tell you a bit why. But um, uh, 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 I have many colleagues in this room uh, uh, who have many more years of experience in this field than I do. So uh, uh, I, I had to tread very lightly when I made this talk. And any of them should feel free to contribute uh, to this discussion. It's, it doesn't have to end with my talk. So. I will say that this is one of the most uh, difficult times I ever had preparing a talk um, because I've never had to give a talk that was this general in nature. Um, as, as, uh, as, as you'll see, uh, in my opinion, anything that is touched by the diffraction of light is, a, is debatably a metasurface. Maybe that's why I don't like the term. So it, it, it's very difficult to prepare a talk with such a broad expanse of, 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 of scope. Um, uh, so. I will do my best to introduce it in a gentle way. I was told to do it for people who have no experience in this area, but looking around the room, I'm not sure how many people here have no experience with this area. So now I'm feeling a little bit uh, self-conscious, but uh, uh, I, I'm going to try to give you an overview of what I see as the essentials uh, of this field. Um, and I, I tried to, um, I tried to uh, include as little of my own work as possible, um, uh, just to, to check any bias I may have. Um, so uh, uh, with that, I, I, will, I will commence. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, uh, are uh, very, very quickly, what is a metasurface? Uh, what I think the definition is. Of course, there is no definition, so it's really just my definition. Then I'm going to give you some historical context for this field of metasurfaces. Then I'm going to talk about uh, how it is that, that uh, metasurfaces impart phase, or what the different methods are. Um, and, and in particular, also why it is that we care about phase in particular. Um, then I'm going to touch briefly on metasurface polarization optics. That's where my own bias enters because I think that that is the most interesting and mo most potentially new application of metasurfaces uh, as compared to decades of past work in this area. And then I will uh, very briefly at the end uh, touch on some potential applications in astronomy, uh, including in coronography, high contrast imaging, and that will serve as a segue to Dimitri's talk. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So what is a metasurface? Uh, uh, well, the answer is I'm not really sure uh, after all these years. Uh, 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 one definition that you'll often see invoked, and I think it's an okay one, is, is that it is, a, it is an array of phase shifting elements that's intended to enact some desired function on a wavefront, of, on an optical, usually optical wavefront, but not necessarily as I've shown here on the right side. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, one criterion that people invoke is that this, uh, this array of phase shifting elements should be sub-wavelength in spacing uh, uh, with respect to the, the wavelength and the medium in, which these, in these, which these structures exist. And this definition could be applied to almost any uh, 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 shape, almost any type of material, and almost any type of wavelength. So here we have some of the, what the, ear the early work on what people called metasurfaces, which was in the mid-infrared with gold. Uh, and these, these were micron scale features. Then later work in the visible with uh, dielectric materials. And uh, uh, in the near infrared, where we have some of uh, John's inverse design structures that I'm sure he'll talk about that are uh, in the near infrared. Uh, 
But then uh, also counting as metasurfaces are things that microwaves and radio frequencies uh, that have features that are large enough that you can see by eye. Uh, everything scales with the wavelength, right? Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, this, this area is impossibly broad. There's been an explosion in the last 10 to 15 years in this area people call metasurfaces. Um, uh, uh, and people have proposed this for so many applications, I couldn't fit them on one slide. But I, I put five highlights here. There's the area of metal lenses, uh, which are essentially just nanofabricated Fresnel lenses. Um, there's people have proposed these for spectroscopy, for miniaturized cameras, for polarization optics and polarimetry, that's been my area. And also in the area of uh, optical orbital angular momentum and vortex phase plates, which I think is the most relevant to this workshop. Um, uh, uh, but uh, what I wish to impart on you is that perhaps any topic that involves free space propagation can relate to metasurfaces, and this makes that an impossibly broad field to cover, especially in 45 minutes. Uh, now, one thing that you'll often see uh, when people talk about metasurfaces are hyperbolic statements. Like you, you'll see uh, in the popular press, at least, people say things like, oh, with metasurfaces, we'll be able to take entire camera objectives and compress them into a flat plane where we'll be able to take a microscope objective and compress it to a flat plane. I hope we can dispense with this immediately. It's not true. Uh, uh, and it is, it, is, it, is, um, it is an unfortunate symptom of the way that this field has been portrayed in the, in the scientific community, in my opinion. So uh, you'll often hear people uh, uh, discuss metasurfaces as 2D metamaterials. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, you'll also hear the term flat optics, a term I'm also not necessarily a fan of. Um, but uh, uh, what I want to uh, 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 say at the outset is that any application involving metasurfaces, any application involving diffractive optics is going to be highly nuanced. Um, there is no such thing as replacing uh, a bulk optic element with a metasurface. There will always be some trade-offs. And uh, uh, it is the very subtle and nuanced exercise to figure out whether those trade-offs are worth it or whether you've actually added any advantage to the system uh, in the end by including a metasurface. And so discussions like this are key because this is a highly nuanced topic. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, so in, in what follows, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, metasurface optics. As I said, these always involve trade-offs. I'm going to uh, uh, imperfectly review what I find to be ascent, the essential physical principles at a very high level here. And uh, 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 one point I want to make is that I'm only going to talk about so-called passive metasurfaces. So uh, uh, these are just uh, uh, passive structures that manipulate the, the wave front of light and they cannot be adjusted after they're made. Uh, um, to me, uh, uh, that is some, at the same time limiting, but I also think that um, uh, 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 passive, being passive is one of the, the strongest upsides of metasurfaces in general. So I, I, I personally don't believe that active metasurfaces have the same level of advantages that passive ones can have. Um, yeah, uh, so I say I'm going to imperfectly review these, these aspects of the field. I, uh, every slide that I'm about to show is an entire subfield uh, with hundreds of papers. So uh, uh, it's very difficult for me to discuss this uh, because uh, I, I'm leaving so much out. So. I wanted to begin with, with the history. Where did this field come from? Um, we should start in the 18th century. So uh, 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 what I call the first metasurface was actually made of human hair. Uh, 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 the, there was a scientist in uh, early colonial and then uh, Pennsylvania uh, named David Rittenhouse. He actually worked at the University of Pennsylvania, which is where I studied as an undergraduate in a building named after him. It's a terrible building, by the way. Um, and what he did is he actually approached a watchmaker and he said, can you cut me a very precise screw? And he took two of them and he strung his hair in between the screws, the screws. And in that way, he was able to space his hair at a precision spacing. If you're wondering what this is, this is what, this used to be a version of lowercase s in early, in early English. So anyway, um, uh, yeah. So to me, uh, what David Rittenhouse did in the 18th century actually holds all of the essential aspects of what we do in metasurfaces today. He had to approach someone from precision industry to give him a part. That's something we do today. He, he fabricated something. Uh, that's something we do today with the precision part. And more than that, he wrote in his original letter describing his hair diffraction grating that uh, uh, he could see when he held it up to the sky that the slit that he made in his windowsill in order to let the sunlight in split into three. 
And he actually said that then he took a different precision screw and made a second hair diffraction grating that had a different density. And when he held that up to the sky, the spacing of the, the, spacing of the slits changed. So this holds all of the essential aspects of a modern metasurface paper. He made something. He did a test and saw when he changed it that the far field changed. This is also what we do today. Uh, so uh, uh, even in the, in the 19th century, um, uh, uh, we had the precursors to metal lenses, which were uh, you know, Fresnel lenses. These are at the size scales that Fresnel was making, for instance, for lighthouses. These were uh, uh, indeed ref refractive elements. But if you were to shrink the zones and to make this thinner and thinner, it would become a diffractive optical element. And of course, Fresnel's zone plate, which is from the very early 19th century, is a metasurface. It's a purely diffractive optical element, albeit not a subwavelength one. Another criticism you often hear about this field, um, uh, which to be honest with you is 100% correct, is that it has all been anticipated in the microwave community. Um, uh, and uh, obviously, the Second World War saw a a flurry of activity in, in microwaves and radar, and many of the concepts from metasurfaces today were, were anticipated in that field by many, many decades. It's true. One thing, however, that is different about microwaves versus optics is that uh, light can be detected coherently very easily, which is something that is very challenging in optics usually. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll often hear people say, oh, aren't metasurfaces just phased arrays? It's true, yes, they are. Aren't meta lenses just reflect arrays? It's also true, yes, they are. I mean, that looks a whole lot like a metal lens to me. Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I, I feel that that should be acknowledged as being true. But uh, uh, moving past the 18th century, the 19th century, moving past the 1940s, uh, what I think is the genesis of the modern field of diffractive optics and of metasurfaces in general is the inception of holography, which itself is owed to the invention of the laser in 1960. So uh, holography, which was the subject of the 1971 Nobel Prize, is really about uh, uh, coherently recording the uh, interference of wave fronts. That was the original idea of Gabor, originally with electron beams before the laser was invented. And uh, 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 the idea, uh, as many of you know, I'm sure, is that if you have an object that scatters light and produces some wave front, that wave front can be recorded and played back uh, uh, with the same laser later. This was a revolutionary idea. Uh, but the revolutionary idea that I consider as the genesis of the modern field of metasurfaces is in the late 1960s, with the invention of something known as computer-generated holography. And uh, the, the term computer-generated holography sounds antiquated to us today, but uh, 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 in the 1960s, the idea of anything being generated by a computer was a very uh, cool uh, buzzword, which is probably why they called it that. Uh, and uh, this work, uh, uh, began with the realization that uh, in holography, in order to record a wavefront, that wavefront, we actually have to have it. We have to have an object producing that wavefront to record it. Uh, but what uh, Brown and Lohmann uh, realized, actually, uh, when they were researchers at IBM in the San Francisco Bay Area, was that uh, what if we had an object that we could engineer? Then we could synthesize the wavefront that we never had in the first place. The hologram could be generated by computer. That's a metasurface. That's what we do today. We generate holograms by computer. So what they said in their original paper is usually a hologram is produced by means of an interference experiment. However, we can let a computer-guided plotter draw the hologram. If you read deeper into the paper, it was actually even more crude than that. Uh, the production of the filter or hologram was done first at large scale, then photographically reduced. In one case, the drawing was made by hand, in the other by a computer-generated plotter. Uh, yeah. That sounds a whole lot like uh, David Rittenhouse's paper, maybe a few hundred years earlier. He, he kind of hacked something together, right? Uh, uh, with the most precise equipment that they had available at that time. So needless to say, we've gotten better printers. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, I often say that our field is a barnacle on the side of the semiconductor industry, and that's what this plot shows. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whereas in the 1960s, we had to rely on hand drawing and photographically reducing, in the meanwhile, uh, uh, the, 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 the drive to make smaller and smaller and smaller transistors has, driven, has, has made equipment for uh, lithographically producing extremely small features um, uh, more and more widely available. And uh, the, the ability to optically produce features smaller than visible light has, has been, has been uh, widespread since the 1990s. Of course, what's possible with electron beam lithography has always been several steps ahead. Uh, uh, but the, uh, 
the, 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 the trend uh, of this uh, high volume application for transistor fabrication has meant that there is more and more and more equipment available uh, for producing extremely small features, smaller than the wavelengths of light. Uh, so uh, 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 this was not uh, newly realized with metasurfaces. This has been known for a very long time. Uh, and there, ha there was a field that developed in this time frame when the lithography was getting good enough to uh, match the wavelengths of light, known as diffractive optics. Um, and uh, uh, people have been working on diffractive optics uh, uh, using electron beam lithography and other uh, semiconductor techniques since at least the 1970s, but it really had a renaissance in the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, I'm just showing a few examples here. Uh, 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 notable is the work that was conducted at MIT Lincoln Laboratory on multi-level diffractive optical elements in the late 1980s. There's a classic paper by Swanson. I recommend you look it up for these multi-level diffractive optical elements. Um, it's notable, of course, that JPL has been silently working on diffractive optics before and after the genesis of metasurfaces. Uh, this I took from their webpage as a, as a dot pattern generator um, uh, that was actually put on one of the Mars rovers, I believe. And I, I included a dot pattern generator because dot pattern generation is a historically important application of diffractive optics. I include this image because if any of you have a, an iPhone after the iPhone X, uh, you have a diffractive optic dot pattern generator in your pocket that's used as part of the face ID module. Um, and uh, these diffractive optical elements were mostly multi-binary, as in this case, or multi-level in nature. Um, uh, 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 but there were early anticipations of uh, the, the preferred technique that's used today in metasurfaces um, uh, by Philippe Lalanne. Uh, uh, in France in the late 1990s, uh, uh, who was making structures that by all accounts are, are identical to the type of metasurfaces that we consider today. Um, uh, I also, uh, uh, you know, uh, that wasn't limited to academia and science. There were whole companies that were producing diffractive optical elements. So uh, I, 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 before when I was making this talk, I wrote up a friend I have in Boston who worked for this company in the 1990s, Digital Optics Corporation, which was in uh, North Carolina. And I just said, can you send me a bunch of your old marketing material? And he did. And uh, 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 it looks identical to the marketing material that people use for metasurfaces today. The claims, the pictures, identical. Uh, 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 so the question is, why, uh, uh, why, is, why are metasurfaces regarded as a new and emerging field in 2024? What, what, why? Uh, so uh, uh, to do some entomology on the word metasurface, we have to look at the meta which is, comes from metamaterials. What are metamaterials? That would be a whole other a week long seminar to be honest with you. But uh, uh, metamaterials were a field that was rising in parallel to diffractive optics but not, communicate, not communicating with it very much uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, this field sort of began at UCSD uh, with uh, Shelby Schultz and David Smith uh, with the idea that uh, using a split ring resonator we could make a medium that exhibited a negative refractive index at microwave frequencies. Followed shortly thereafter um, by the realization that if we had a slab of negative refractive index material, it could amplify evanescent waves and thereby surmount the diffraction limit and make a so-called perfect lens. There were a lot of other very exotic far out there ideas uh, around optical cloaking and what people call transformation optics. But generally, the motivating principle of the field of metamaterials was to make new devices in physics by controlling the constitutive parameters of artificial dielectric media. Um, uh, uh, and this was a heroic field. It had a good run. Uh, uh, to be very blunt, and hopefully not to insult anyone, none of this worked. Um, uh, uh, there were some heroic experiments in which people were able to observe uh, sub-diffraction limited lensing or negative refractive index at very limited microwave frequencies, but there were always severe practical limitations to making this happen. Uh, so uh, uh, at around the time, uh, uh, around the year 2010, there had been 10 years of people trying this. There was a lot of frustration um, uh, in this field, you know, that it had such great promises, but it couldn't deliver anything practical. That was, there was a great frustration. So the metasurfaces and plasmonics field, by the way, which I'm not talking about uh, here today, was primed for something exciting. People were impatient. They wanted something to happen. They wanted to see a device that they could all buy into. Um, and then this paper came along, which uh, happened to come from my PhD group, uh, 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 which was called the Generalized Laws of Reflection and Refraction. Um, and uh, essentially what they did in this paper uh, uh, is they created a grading. They created a blazed grading. Uh, 
uh, uh, but it was described in the language of metamaterials and plasmonics. So uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this completely refocused the eye of the entire metamaterials community onto diffractive optics, although they maybe didn't realize it at the time. Uh, so uh, uh, the metamaterials community jumped into diffractive optics after the publishing, publication of this paper because this device really worked. The claim was that it would take light and it would steer it in a different direction. And that was called a two-dimensional metamaterial, but really what it was was a diffractive optical element. Um, but it worked. It was incontrovertible that it worked, unlike all of the re negative refractive index and cloaking sort of stuff. This felt very practical, and you could make lenses out of it, and all sorts of exciting things that felt like they could fit into real optical system. So this set off a flurry of research in this direction that's still going on today. Uh, so uh, uh, the history of metasurfaces is it's really a convergence of multiple fields. Uh, 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 there's, of course, diffractive optics and holography and micro and nanofabrication, which go back a very, 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 very long way. But it, it represents the jumping of people in the fields of metamaterials and plasmonics into this field and everything combined. And whatever we call it, whatever the semantics of this are, uh, uh, the result is that there are more people thinking about diffractive optics than there ever have been before in history with more advanced tools that are more widely distributed than they ever have been before. Uh, and that is really what metasurfaces are and why we're still talking about them today. Okay, so uh, 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 now that we, we can conclude our history lesson and I can go into a little bit of physics, uh, uh, and I'm going to tell you what I think are the most basic uh, design considerations of these metasurface optical elements. Uh, so uh, on this slide, I show what I, call, what I called for the purpose of this presentation, the central dogma of metasurfaces. You know, in molecular biology, they have a central dogma about how DNA is transcribed. I, I thought we should have a central dogma, so I made one, um, uh, uh, like a religious leader or something. But uh, 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 the central dogma is in five steps. Uh, uh, we, we have illumination, which is very frequently just assumed to be a plane wave at a fixed angle with a fixed polarization. Uh, uh, we have the metasurface itself which uh, is commonly assumed, but it's not inherently so that it's of a fixed height. We have what I call the near field, uh, uh, which is the field that is produced by the metasurface from the incident wave just above the uh, metasurface as dictated by Maxwell's equations. We have a propagator, uh, which could be an exact propagator like a plane wave expansion, or it could be one that's approximate like just the Fourier transform in the Fraunhofer regime. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not being specific about that. And we have a far field. Uh, 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 which is uh, the, the propagator applied to the near field, which is the desired function that the optic should enable, well, otherwise known as the merit criterion. I'm sure that's what John will call it in his presentation. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the, in general, it should be said that this uh, uh, requires the solution uh, of Maxwell's equations over large macroscopic areas. So for instance, if I change anything about the metasurface, even in just one location, in general, we have to solve Maxwell's equations again to link the illumination to the near field, and uh, uh, that can be very cumbersome. So in practice, in the field of metasurfaces, whether they say it or not, there are two big approximations that, are, that people are applying. And I call these the, the two local approximations. Uh, uh, local approximation number one is that the metasurface is acting locally on the field. Um, in other words, it is, uh, uh, it is an optically thin element, uh, uh, which is to say that the, the input field and the output field are linked by something that just acts locally. That, that it comes in, it, it, it is phase shifted or amplitude modulated and it exits at the same point. You could say, state that uh, in, in terms of scalars or also with polarization, in which case it would be a local Jones matrix. So in other words, this is a way of saying that light is not redistributed by propagation through the metasurface. It, for those of you who are familiar with the field of holography, this is very similar to the distinction between thin and thick holograms. Uh, the second local approximation is one that people in the field of metasurfaces call the locally periodic approximation. Uh, so the locally periodic approximation is the assumption is that the behavior of every element that you put in the metasurface, every discrete di dielectric structure is independent of its neighbors. So for instance, if we have a pretty typical looking section of a metasurface, anytime I change one of these, in general, we, we can't really assume anything. We would have to solve Maxwell's equations again. But the locally periodic approximation uh, would be to say that this one is acting independently of its neighbors. The function of this one can be ascribed to this one and this one alone. 
uh, and what that means is that we can kind of assume that this one is behaving as though it were an in, it, as if it were embedded in an infinite array of ones just like it. This enables us to make metasurfaces desi metasurface designs based on uh, libraries, which is to say that we can just solve Maxwell's equation once in a parameter sweep by solving what the field is at the exit of an infinite array of, of alike structures uh, and solve for its phase and amplitude uh, in the far field. And then when we go and design the metasurface, we can ask what's the desired phase and amplitude of the transfer function at this point and refer back to the library. I call this the locally periodic approximation. Um, now, both of these local approximations, the one about the, the locality of the transfer function and this one about the local, locally peri local periodicity of the elements are ways of stating the paraxial limit. They're ways of stating that we're operating at small angles. In general, for large angle, angular displacements or angles of incidence, we have no choice but to solve Maxwell's equations in full. Uh, okay, uh, another question to ask is why do we emphasize sub-wavelength? Uh, 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 so the reason for this uh, is that you may remember from the, the very nature of the discrete Fourier transform is that if you have something in real space that's sampled on a grid with a separation delta y, in conjugate space, the, uh, the, the Fourier transform exchanges the role of the sampling and the support. Uh, so in the angular frequency, in the, in, the, in the angle space, the spatial frequency space of Fourier optics, it means that if you sample on a sub-wavelength pitch, the diffraction orders from the sampling will go out to 90 degrees and then beyond as the wavelength, as the sampling becomes sub-wavelength. So for super wavelength sampling, we can only control this central region and then we'll have copies of it on higher diffraction orders that also appear in the far field. But the moment the sampling becomes uh, wavelength scale or sub-wavelength, those diffraction orders are driven to evanescence. They're driven into being non-propagating orders and we have control over a, a more sizable fraction of the angular half space. So in other words, we avoid diffraction from the meta atoms uh, uh, if, we, if we insist on sub-wavelength sampling. Another question you might ask is why are we always talking about phase? Uh, so uh, 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 obviously the complete picture involves amplitude and phase, uh, uh, but in diffractive optics, uh, phase only diffractive optics are almost always preferable because uh, 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 modulating the loss locally entails the loss of photons. But if we're able to modulate phase, we can instead, when combined with propagation, uh, modulate amplitude without sacrificing any of the photons, simply redistributing them. And this is uh, just a consequence of the mathematical fact that if we have two phasers on the unit circle, their sum or average is no longer necessarily on the unit circle. So it's always preferable to modulate phase because we can derive amplitude modulation as a consequence of phase modulation if we're allowed to propagate. Okay, so what are the ways of, of implement, imparting phase with a metasurface? Way number one is just simple propagation. People have been doing this for a very long time. In traditional diffractive optics, that would be by having some continuous height profile of some refractive index media. Of course, this is usually very hard to make, although the JPL people who are very good at grayscale lithography would disagree with me there. Uh, but the more common way uh, is to make a multi-level diffractive optical element um, uh, and have n discrete levels, which would require a, a base two log of n aligned lithography and etching steps. And then the phase you impart is just uh, two pi over lambda, times n times the height. And of course you have this uh, one over lambda dependence in the phase. With metasurfaces, the more common way, although this was not uh, exclusively the provenance of metasurfaces, is to have uniform height structures and modulate their transverse profile, thereby controlling the effective index that light experiences locally when propagating through them. Uh, another way, which is very popular, both in earlier diffractive optics and in metasurfaces, is something known as the geometric phase. Now this is uh, very counterintuitive the first time you ever learn of it, but this uh, comes about from polarization state transformations. So if we have circularly polarized light that goes through a half wave plate, it will flip into the other circular polarization, but it turns out, and you can show, that it will pick up a phase depending on the angular orientation of the half wave plate. And we can use that angular orientation of the half wave plate to impart a phase on the light that actually is achromatic. However, the efficiency with which we do it is not usually achromatic, but that's a different story. Uh, this is one of the most popular methods of imparting phase in diffractive optics and uh, metasurfaces. The, the, the third way is what we call the detour phase. Uh, 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 this one was used in the first computer generated hologram demonstration. This one's kind of a hack. If you have light that comes in at an incident angle or if you're observing at an incident angle, 
The incident wave front will be phased just because of the tilt angle. It will be zero here and two pi here. And if we place a scatterer or a hole anywhere in there, just by linearly controlling its position, we can control the phase. Um, this, this, this one is not very popular, but it, it's, it's uh, very straightforward to understand. The last method I'll mention only briefly because every time I hear about it, I feel like uh, it's not being explained clearly, and I myself don't fully understand it, is uh, to impart phases based on resonances. This is a whole field. You'll see people call this Huygens metasurfaces or metronics. That's an, I find that an interesting term. The idea is that by overlapping magnetic and electric resonances in small structures, you're able to sweep from zero to two pi phase uh, over the resonance uh, uh, without, they say, losing any transmission efficiency. Uh, uh, but this is a resonance. It's kind of a gentle resonance. Usually it has the quality factor of about 10. Uh, this enables you to impart phase with sort of lower aspect ratio structures, but uh, you don't see this used very often because everything then becomes an order of magnitude more sensitive. Uh, the dispersion of the phase, fabrication tolerances, angle sensitivity. Uh, I, want to, I, want to, I want to mention very briefly uh, metasurface polarization optics, which I think is the most uh, novel aspect of this uh, field of metasurfaces. So one thing that's uh, notable to mention is that uh, uh, metasurface elements can have what's known as shape biofringence. Normally when we talk about biofringence or polarization optical components, we're talking about the inherent crystalline uh, anisotropy of, of materials such as calcite or quartz or magnesium fluoride. Uh, but with metasurface elements, we can make artificial biofringence by shape structuring. And in this way, it means we can make very unique polarization components where the polarization uh, constitutive parameters can vary as a function of space across the optical element. Uh, I've done a lot of my work on this, uh, 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 but rather than summarize it for you here, um, the, the key element of this in my uh, view is that it means that a metasurface can be a multitasking polarization optical component, and we can impart the function of many different polarization optical elements in one plane. Um, uh, I'll be a bit more specific about that in a moment. Uh, uh, so in other words, we can control the Jones matrix transfer function of both the near field and the far field, which I know is a concept that's invoked in the modeling of high contrast imagers in all telescopes where there are polarization aberrations present. But with a metasurface, uh, you, you have significant flexibility to engineer them. Uh, rather than talk more about uh, my own work and polarization, I would point you to this review article that I wrote a few years ago, which is a very uh, detailed accounting of what is possible with polarization sensitive metasurfaces and all other polarization sensitive diffractive optics that have existed since the 1960s. So in the three minutes I have left, I wanted to go over some very uh, emerging applications in astronomy as a segue to uh, Dimitri's talk. Uh, uh, something I, I want to talk first about a project that I'm engaged with, uh, with Lisa, who's in the first row here, uh, 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 which is the concept of what we call metasurface polarization splitters. With metasurfaces, we're able to make a very new type of diffraction grating uh, where, that has diffracted orders that can serve as polarizers for an arbitrary set of polarization states. And uh, we have a project uh, with what used to be known as Ball Aerospace, I should have changed the logo, and uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research where we've embedded one of these in the uh, pupil plane of a telescope. And this enables very compact and simultaneous astrophysical polarimetry, in this case for uh, solar physics. So uh, recently, we integrated such an instrument at a, uh, a state-of-the-art uh, solar telescope in New Mexico, uh, 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 and uh, there's, our, there's our metasurface polarization splitter as part of a larger telescope system, which is receiving the feed from uh, uh, this large uh, solar telescope, 64-inch primary mirror. Uh, uh, this is where I was last week with Lisa. Uh, I'm just showing you here. This is the raw image uh, formed by the metasurface. Each of these orders is analyzing for these different polarization states in parallel, and we're scanning uh, spectrally over a sunspot with an etalon. And in this one, which encodes for a circular polarization, you can kind of see a sweep as we go across the line, which is actually owed to the Zeeman effect. Uh, I wanted to comment briefly on Kent's uh, profile uh, uh, project that, that I became aware of which is Zernike wavefront sensing. I had never heard of this concept before I read about it last week, but I was heartened to realize that it's actually just the same as Zernike's phase contrast microscope. And in this project, uh, Kent uh, and, and colleagues uh, uh, used a metasurface as the pi phase shifting plate in the Zernike phase contrast microscope, but they did it in a polarization sensitive way in order to recover the full two pi dynamic range of phase sensing. I have a lot of thoughts about this. I look forward to discussing this. This seems very similar to me to what people in microscopy uh, do in the realm of quantitative phase imaging. Uh, 
And the last thing I'll talk about as a segue to Dimitri's talk is, of course, Vortex faceplates for coronography, which he and colleagues have been working on uh, for at least 15 years. Uh, so uh, these have traditionally been realized with uh, liquid crystals, and the idea is that when placed in a coronagraph, this vortex phase plate uh, uh, will, will, will disperse the light of the central star to be uh, stopped by the Leo stop and will, uh, 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 and will allow the, the light from the exoplanet to pass through with ideally very high contrast. Uh, so with that, I wanted to conclude because it was said during the, um, the, the beginning of the, the, the study telecom meeting that uh, something we would want to discuss here would be the comparison of liquid crystal geometric phase optics with current work in dielectric metasurfaces. That co conversation can continue throughout the week, but uh, uh, I, I wanted to compare and contrast them. How much time do I have left? Two minutes. Okay, I can cover this in two minutes. Um, so the, these are a hard uh, thing to compete with. Uh, they're very, very good. Uh, and by the way, I would consider these metasurfaces by the by the modern definition if we're, if we're arguing about semantics. But um, their upsides is that they can be very easily patterned over large areas because they can be written by with direct right laser lithography. And then uh, on a photo alignment layer, then you can spin liquid crystals directly on top of them and they self-align, beautiful. Uh, and you can do this easily in multiple layers to achromatize it just by spin coding. It's very hard to beat. Um, uh, 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 but uh, the reliance on self-alignment -alliance, uh, can be prone to defects at the smallest size scales, like in this picture. Um, uh, the, the extent of polarization control that they uh, can impart is limited compared to what metasurfaces can do. Uh, and if you don't want polarization control, there's nothing you can do about it because they're liquid crystals. And they're polymers, which is, uh, as I understand it, not ideal for a space application. With dielectric metasurfaces, we have much harder fabrication. Um, and even more challenging fabrication if you want to do multiple layers. You can't just spin coat another metasurface on. But uh, that they have the highest spatial resolution available. They can have enhanced control over the light, light polarization, can make them either polarization sensitive or insensitive, and they can be made of materials that are much better for space purposes. So I hope we can, can, we can uh, continue that discussion. Um, that's actually all I had. Um, so, yeah.